Hey guys, welcome to another VFX vlog where you get to ask me filmmaking and visual effects related questions and I will try my best to answer them. In the first part of this vlog I'm going to answer a user question relating to the workflow between Adobe Premiere and Adobe After Effects and then in the second part I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the common problems that people encounter when using the 3D camera tracker in Adobe After Effects. <laughs> One question I got on YouTube from, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, Harley Peebly is, one thing I struggle with is a good workflow when working between Premiere Pro and After Effects. In order to talk about a good workflow between Premiere Pro and After Effects is to first understand what these tools are actually used for. Adobe Premiere is meant for editing, which means you import all of your footage there, you organize it and you arrange them and cut them together to set up your final film. Adobe After Effects, on the other hand, is a video compositing software which you can use to composite different layers of visual elements to set up special effects for your clips. There's basically two ways to integrate Premiere Pro with After Effects and I kind of use both depending on the situation. The first one is you can actually right click a clip in Premiere Pro and replace it with an After Effects composition. This embeds the After Effects composition directly in your Premiere project and any changes you make in After Effects will directly be reflected in your Premiere project. The second option is to select one or many clips in Premiere Pro and copy and paste them into an After Effects composition, do all of your visual effects in After Effects, export from After Effects and then re-import that video file into Premiere Pro. For me, which way I go depends on the situation. If all I want is some visual effects on a single clip in a Premiere project, I usually replace it with an After Effects composition. It just kind of makes it nice and easy. But the moment I work on bigger visual effects, like something that's very computationally heavy or something that's just very complex or involves multiple clips, I much rather just copy my files from Premiere into an After Effects composition, do all of the work in After Effects, export the final video and re-import it into Premiere Pro. But enough talking, let me show you exactly how to do those things with Premiere Pro and After Effects. If this does not look like After Effects to you, no, there's nothing wrong with your eyes. This is actually Adobe Premiere. I use Adobe Premiere for all my editing work. So what I have here is a really rough edit of the Zombie Hunter video that we did for one of the Halloweens. I think it was actually two years ago now. We did a Zombie Hunter visual effects short film that I recommend you check out if you haven't yet. This is the raw edit, so there's no color correction, there's no visual effects and nothing on it yet. This was just the first edit to give me an idea of what the movie would look like. For an integrated workflow between Adobe Premiere and After Effects, you actually have two options. For one, let's say you have a single clip that you need to add some visual effects to. So for example, I've got one here where I just shoot someone. So I want to add a muzzle flash down in here. So what you can do is you can actually select your clip, you can right click it and you can't see it because it's off the screen. There's an option in the context menu. Let me see if I can make this smaller so you can actually see it. Nope. The menu is just a little bit too long. There's an option in the context menu which says replace with After Effects composition. If you click that, what will happen? Adobe Premiere will actually replace this clip with an active After Effects composition. So it's now automatically going to pop up After Effects to me. Um, After Effects comes up, um, asks me where it wants that effect to be saved. Let's just call it Muzzle Flash. And so what I have here, it created me a new composition which tells me it's a link composition with my clip in it. So what I can do in here, I can actually import a piece of stock footage. Let's just quickly import something from Action Essentials 2. Let's just take a simple muzzle flash, uh, drag that in. Obviously, I'm not really going for realism or great effect here. I just kind of want to give you a rough idea of what you can do. Let's say you added some lighting for the muzzle flash as well. To fade out within three frames. So this is the effect we have now. If I now save this composition here in After Effects and go back to my Premiere project, you will see here that it's actually linked to an After Effects composition. And within Premiere, you can see the effect that I've added in After Effects. The great thing for directly linking Premiere and After Effects is that any change you make in After Effects, let's say for whatever reason I decide I want to tint this one green. So I'm just going to apply a tint effect onto that. Let's say we're going to make our muzzle flash green. Maybe let's make this blue, it's a sci-fi gun. If we now go back to Adobe Premiere and play this back again, you will see that the muzzle flash has been updated to be blue. So you're basically working in Adobe After Effects for all the effects that you want to add, but they're being rendered out in Adobe Premiere. If you export this project, it would actually render out the After Effects composition into your final project. It's a really easy and smooth workflow for adding visual effects to single clips. But let's say you wanted to add visual effects over a whole range of clips. Let's say all of these clips needed some visual effect that I wanted to add. Now I could link each of these ones individually to an After Effects composition, but what I can do 
I can actually select all of these ones and go copy. So I go Control C. I'll jump over into After Effects. Let's create a new composition. Let's call it sequence for now. It's 30 seconds long, 1920 by 1080, which is my resolution. Click OK. And now what I can do is I can go in here and I can Control V to paste the clips I copied from Premiere. What you see here, it pasted all of the clips from Premiere in the right order with the right edits directly into my After Effects composition. So now in here I can edit any visual effects that I want to. Obviously I'd have to export this one and put it back into Premiere because I haven't actually linked it. So obviously updating this composition will not have any effect on these ones because they're not linked. But it's an easy way to pull your footage across from Adobe Premiere into After Effects to add your visual effects, export it and bring it back into Premiere. And that is the two methods that I use for workflow integration between Adobe Premiere and Adobe After Effects. I hope that makes it a little bit clearer on how to best work with Premiere Pro and After Effects within your own workflow. And now for the After Effects part of this vlog. One tool that I've been using ever since After Effects CS6 came out is the inbuilt 3D camera tracker. The 3D camera tracker allows you to track your footage and derive a virtual 3D camera that represents the real camera you use to film your scene. Once you've tracked your footage, you can place all sorts of visual elements into the 3D space of your original scene. And this allows you to create some really cool advanced effects and 3D integrations. Now, as great as the 3D camera tracker is, there are some really common issues that people come across. The most common one being could not solve camera. The next one is no depth from a camera pans off. And there are a few other issues that people encounter when using the 3D camera tracker. And I want to jump into After Effects, show you a few of the things that can go wrong and how you can potentially resolve your problems. Now, the first and most common mistake is that people tend to assume the 3D camera tracker will just track anything. You can just throw anything at it and it'll just figure it out magically. Unfortunately, that is not the case, like in this clip here, which I used for my building destruction tutorial. Now, if you look at this clip here, you will notice that there's some crazy camera movement in here where the camera swings down below the barrier onto the ground, and then it'll rise up again as the building collapses in the background. Now, I actually did what you should be doing to track this footage. So I've created another comp where I masked myself out because I didn't want to obviously influence the 3D camera tracker. And I thought, ah, oh, maybe, you know, you've got some chance of tracking this. But with this crazy movement here, the camera tracker is going to be totally lost. And all you're going to get when you do the 3D camera tracker on this is analysis solve failed. That shouldn't come too surprising to you. It's super shaky. At the, in these frames, there's not much for the camera tracker, no, not many details here for the camera tracker to really hold on to or attach to and track anything at all. So in the end, what I actually did for my 3D building destruction tutorial, I actually tracked the first part individually up until this point. Then I skipped all of that. And then I tracked it again from this point here when the camera rose again above the barrier and you could see the city again, because in the city itself, there's lots of details that the 3D camera tracker can attach to. If your footage is too shaky, the 3D camera tracker will just not work. Either you have to track certain parts of your footage where the shot is fairly stable, or you will simply have to reshoot your clip. It's just the way the 3D camera tracker works. It has to have some proper contrast and good details in the shots and be fairly stable, at least to have some chance of solving it. Now let's look at the second example. This is the clip for the intro of my fireworks tutorial and I've already tracked it. And as you can see, the track points actually are nicely attached to the city. There's plenty of them because I went with a detailed analysis and the average error is about 0.86 pixels, which really just indicates that each track point on average is off by less than a pixel from the point that it's trying to track. So this is actually a pretty good track and there's plenty of track points. And as you can see, if you look at the top of the building here, the track points properly follow the shot, even when the camera is moving, obviously there's a few new ones coming in. You'll see there's no track points on me, but that's because again, in order to track this, I first mask myself out. So that I didn't influence the actual 3D camera tracker. And you should always do that. Any moving foreground elements that could confuse the tracker, mask them out first, pre-compose the layers, and then track the resulting footage so that the camera tracker really only looks at the static geometry in your scene, which will make it really nice and easy to track. Now, second issue, even though I have a good track here, and even though I have a lot of information here, if I hover over these points, I get a big target mark. And at the bottom, you may notice it says, no depth from a tripod pan solve. A lot of people get really confused by this because it means there's something missing. Also, you may notice that all of the track points are exactly the same size, which indicates you have no depth information from the tracking data. The reason that is, is because the camera is pretty stable. It's just panning around. It's not moving forward and backwards through the scene. So the 3D camera tracker can't really figure out how far objects are from one another and it therefore can't derive depth information for your scene. 
So it just does not know that this part of the building might be further away than this one or that, that for example, this front piece here on the barrier is a lot closer than the building. So it just can't figure it out because the camera isn't moving around enough in the space. However, that is usually not an issue because if you did attach elements to any of these track points here in the background, because all the objects are fairly far away and because it is a camera panel software, the camera does not move far forward or backwards, you probably won't notice. Let's place a bit of text here actually. Maybe let's change this color to black as well. Um, so you can actually see what's going on. Ooh, that's a little bit too big. Uh, let's scale that down. So if I now move through my shot, you will see that it's properly tracked to the top of the building. You will not notice that this is not properly tracked because there's no depth of information. Just because for this particular type of shot, it does not really matter. Now, let me show you a clip where the tracking actually worked properly. This one I've also used before. I've used this in my motorcycle explosion tutorial, which you can check out. So this is just a small clip of me walking through a street in Melbourne, kind of panning the camera around, aiming at this motorcycle and then kind of going back. Again, you may notice what's going to come up is uh, unable to solve camera for this frame. Again, here the frames get a little bit too blurry and the tracker, you'll see there's less and less track points as it gets up to this point. And in these places, the, it's just not able to solve the camera again. But for the rest, it's actually properly tracked and you will see that the track points are different size. So the ones on the motorcycle are bigger, getting smaller towards the back and then the ones at the far building are actually really small, indicating that there's proper depth information between the motorcycle and the building. So, so for example, let's create a text here, scale that up a little bit. That's kind of a bit too tiny. Uh, maybe let's make that white and let's call it motorcycle. Um, so as you pan through, you'll see that it's properly tracked to the motorcycle. The cool thing with a properly 3D tracked scene is that you can actually place elements a bit more intelligently in the scene. For example, what I can do is I can actually select three track points here that are on the ground of the street to make a little triangle, which is a flat plane on the surface of the street. I can right click on it and say, create me a piece of text. Uh, let's scale that up a little bit and then let's rotate it a little. So let's stand the text upright in the middle of the street. And let's kind of rotate that up a bit. Yeah, let's be creative again. Let's call it street. So again, as you pan through the shot, you will notice that street is actually in the middle of the street and it follows the camera movement precisely so you can place 3D elements, 2D layers, text, whatever you want in the scene. Now, obviously you may notice that even though the shot gets blurry, this does not get blurry. Um, you can quite easily fix this simply by enabling the motion blur on the actual layer and it'll kind of fit in with the movement of the camera and it'll look a lot more natural. So do remember to turn on the motion blur when you're dealing with tracked footage just so that it blends in with the general blurriness of each frame and just a little bit more naturally and looks. And that's the common issues that you may encounter when using the 3D camera tracker. I really hope that clears up some of the common issues that you may encounter when using the 3D camera tracker in Adobe After Effects. I really hope you enjoyed this vlog. As always, if you have any comments, questions or suggestions, just leave them in the section below and I will get around to answering them. Please remember to subscribe, hit that like button and share the video around. It really helps out a lot. And if you're hungry for more, you can also find and follow me on Facebook or Twitter. Until next time, I will see you later.